All right, thank you so much for staying with us. Now, when you hear special needs, what comes to mind? There are four major types of special needs children, physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional, and then sensory. Helen Obiageli Oshikoya is a lawyer and an advanced certified autism specialist at IBCCES certified and also the founder and executive director of Nobel Lover Gradini Psychoeducational Services, an organization in Nigeria that focuses on the mental health of individuals. She is also a member of the Nigerian Psychological Association, British Psychological Society, as well as a certified specialist assessor. She has been able to provide hospitals, schools, and establishments with the best in developmental, educational, and psychometric tests. Now, remember, you can join the conversation by tweeting to us at Plus TV Africa or Ways Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways, or send an SMS to the numbers on your screen right now. Thank you so much for joining us, Helen. Quite a CV you have there. My goodness, I was like, I was completely blown away Thank you. but oh uh, we're discussing a very sensitive topic today but before we get into that um let me start well you started out as a lawyer yes. while getting to special needs why get into special needs or am i in special needs yeah well why? you are a lawyer why, just, do, why exactly did I why did you switch well, the, well basically there is a need for legal presence in mm -hmm. any form of education right and i felt to myself that our children are losing the opportunity of actually having the best care, knowing fully well that we only focus on the physical development of our children and not the mental development of the children. So being a lawyer, I had to go back and research into what are the opportunities for children who have exceptional needs, so mm -hmm. to speak. And from there, I decided that it would be best for me to be the advocate of those children than to be the advocates of people who have several other lawyers who can advocate for them. That's I talk fantastic. for the children that can, you know, for the people that can't speak for themselves, so to speak. Oh, that is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to special needs. What, what exactly is it? And I understand there are four types of it. If you could quickly walk us through it. Okay, so I'll make a correction. There are over 250 types of special needs. Oh my goodness. Yes. Depending on the compartmental box you put them on. Okay. The four that you're talking about are the ones that we probably see in schools. Oh. There are other ones that you may not see in schools. So when I'm teaching um, teachers, like, like you know, training teachers, mm -hmm. I tend to allow them to focus on the ones they meet in school. Now, special education is a, it's, it's wide and it stems from A to B. But as we go and it's narrowed down, mm -hmm. we focus on what they call additional educational needs. Okay. okay. Because some parents don't accept that their children fall into the category of special education. Mm -hmm. In those days, special education was hearing impaired, mental retardation, um, physically impaired. But today, we have children who are perfectly normal, who look perfectly sweet, but they're unable to learn because they have a neurodevelopmental disorder that is preventing them from learning. Oh. So what are the early signs of these neurodevelopmental disorders? What you always see, and parents always complain about, in the first instance, my child is not talking. Okay. My child was talking, he stopped talking. My child was doing X, Y, Z, he stopped doing X, Y, Z. Because you have a neurodevelopmental disorder which is called child disintegration disorder, which is in the autism spectrum now, where children develop typically. They meet all their milestones, they talk, mm -hmm. they do everything, but when they get to two years, they start disintegrating. Wow. They start losing those skills. And that's why as a teacher and as a clinician, it's mm -hmm. always good to have milestone directives whereby you can determine where the child is and if the child has started to regress. Oh, so you keep a track record of development. You keep the a child track record of development. Where, yes. Oh, and how do you prevent is there like a prevention? You know, I think sorry, or? before we get to prevention, what what causes it? The unfortunate thing is that there's several things that cause it and there is nothing that causes it. I don't understand. So, okay, basically, we do not know. Some 
um, special education needs or additional needs, you can tell when there's been trauma at birth, prematurity okay. Okay. and things like that. But then there's some that come along the way Wait. as the child is growing. Oh. So some you can detect and know the cause. Mm -hmm. So an ear infection will lead to child being deaf, hmm. that you can see. But a child who was perfectly normal and starts and behaving, you can't tell. Yes. Oh, right. So okay. what's the difference so think, between um, specific um, learning disability and um, learning disorder? Okay, so let me go to yeah, her. Yeah, because she asked about mm -hmm. prevention. So prevention. Yes. Mm -hmm. So basically, prevention is screening, okay. developmental screening. Mm -hmm. You screen, you go to the hospital, and your child gets screened, mm. and then the milestones will mm. be plotted. Sometimes mm. it's done in schools, like we do ours in schools. Mm -hmm. We plot in schools to right. identify the children that have the challenge. Mm -hmm. Now the question you said is what the difference between specific learning and disability. learning disorder. Mm -hmm. Specific is that the child has a disability in only one capacity, either reading, writing, okay or motor skills. So it's specific to a particular domain. If you understand domains, then basically domains are motor domain, sensory domain, speech, language, and communication domain. So if the challenge is in just one, one of domain. those, then it is called a specific learning disability. Okay. So you have things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, okay. right, and dysgraphia. Those are the four Mm. that you had mentioned earlier, but they right. are normally seen in children in schools. Mm. That's what you'll see. But learning disorder is a global impairment. So it affects speech, it affects language, it affects motor, it affects communication, social inclusion, everything to do with all the domains of the child's development is affected. So you have things like autism, that comes mm -hmm. in that category. Sometimes you have severe attention deficit comes in that category. You have things like Down syndrome comes in that specific area. And then you have mm -hmm. what another one called cerebral palsy, which you can find in that global category. The only global category you would find in school at times would probably be cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. Down autism. syndrome, and autism. autism. Oh dear, wow, I just realized I really don't know so much. Yeah, I thought exactly. I knew like this this calculator. Yeah. I only mm. just found about found out about this calculator and I was discussing with EC how much I hated mathematics. Mm -hmm. Like I see numbers and I just flip. And I never realized that, that it was a is disorder. what yeah. it's called. And then there's dyslexia and the average child in Nigerian schools, once you can't calculate numbers, you, you get flogged. Uh, yes. 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 So why what what can we do so to teachers would realize that it's really not the child's fault? Stop flogging them. Well, the thing about it is that we do specific screenings for dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So if the child is four years, six months, we will screen and it will tell us exactly that this child is at risk of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So you can start putting in early interventions in place, you know, different okay. programs to help and assist. But you see, in the totality of things, what we have to focus on is that all teachers need to be trained on identification and detection of these children. Too, yes. You know, it's the you know it's mm. the first protocol when it comes to prevention. Mm -hmm. So right. teachers are able to detect, and once teachers are able to detect, some of the things the teachers can correct by themselves, mm -hmm. but some they know that they have to refer for specialist care. So, so if I may step in, let me, let me hear from Faith. Okay. So where do um, parents, if you feel like your child, you can see some signs, where do you go to, who do you reach out to, to get proper screening for your child? Well, the first thing is that you should need to ask your school, do they operate a screening process? Okay. Because screening processes is actually under the school health policy of 2006. It's a federal government policy which says that children should be tested periodically, physically and mentally, to identify those that need to be assisted further. But does that really function in schools these days? Well, it functions in the schools I work with. Okay. Wow. So I've made it, I've, they've made it their policy. Right. So every year the children are screened and children that are struggling 
are identified and obviously referred for specialist care. So parents out there should make sure that whatever school they're enrolling yes, their child they should is, ask it's a prerequisite their school. that they yes, screen kids. Yes. They should ask their school, do you run a school health system? Mm. And then they know fully well that if there is any challenge with the child, it will be picked up in the school health process. Right. Right. If the child is done in school, ideally she go to the pediatrician mm -hmm. and then the pediatrician will refer the child to somebody like me. That's when you notice the signs. Yes, when you mm -hmm. notice the signs. Some signs are very, very, very obvious, okay. even between the ages of one year and 13 months. Parents know there's something wrong, but sometimes they keep it because they'll think, if I say something, then it's, then true. it's true. Or oh, okay. if I tell somebody, they will laugh at me. So it shouldn't be that. What you should be thinking about is the earlier you, you talk, the, the better, better faster you the deal outcome. With it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's one thing parents don't realize. They keep it to mm. themselves and it gets so bad. And at the end of the day, I mean, I had a, an assessment two weeks ago. The child was 15. Oh. And the mom tried to convince me that this child was doing well. And I had to tell her that from these results, I don't think your child was ever doing well. But she had been in denial so much mm -hmm. that she refused to accept that there was something wrong. But he's 15, and in real terms, there's not much we can do. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. It's gone past the age. It's gone past, yeah. yes. It's gone through basic development. Mm. Yes, so yes. basically between zero to three is intervention stage. The first 1,000 da days of development, you can mm -hmm. put a lot of intervention. From four to five, you are working towards preventing it from being a disorder okay. by seven there's nothing any it's a disorder it's but is it possible that some of these um needs develop like beyond seven say eight or nine no no they usually Most, develop at they are, early, the that's why they're called early childhood disorders right they must be present in the early childhood time okay. i have an instance where a boy mom came and said that the child had autism he went through. He went through university. He went through um, secondary school, primary, secondary school, and got to university. Mm. And I said to her, "It's not possible. Your child has what they call schizophrenia. Oh. That's a mental health. Is yeah, a mental. What is that? I'm sorry. It's a mental illness that exhi exhi exhibits itself like a childhood disorder. Okay. All right. But because he never experienced it in his early childhood, it could not have started from inception." So anything that you cannot trace to early childhood, then beyond that, it's a pure mental health issue. So well, is it that all, all um, most um, children that have some sort of um, mental dis or sorry, um, disability or disorder, can you attribute something um, children that have these special needs, disorders or disability to some sort of mental disorder? The thing disorder? about it is that mm, beyond physical mm -hmm. disability yes. anything that's not physical disability it's a mental disability it's not a mental illness okay it's a mental disorder okay so a mental sound... illness okay. you can take medication and sometimes recover okay. mm -hmm. but with a mental disorder you don't recover you manage it oh so oh, it's a lifelong a it's lifelong okay. yes even with specific learning disabilities, it's lifelong. And that's why it's very important that you bring in the right specialist to okay. care, because what happens is that if you bring somebody that's not trained, you only make the matter worse. You compound the disorder, because for mm. everything you do wrong, you're increasing the opportunity of recovery. And that's why we tell parents, you need to go to the qualified people. You know, it's not just somebody, oh, I've been trained. It's about somebody who is certified exactly. to actually carry out these treatments. Mm. Can parents okay. verify, because um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people there lying that they're certified. So yes. what website can they go so to? So for instance, now, if somebody says they were trained by Nobelova Gradani, mm -hmm. you can go to our website and check. Okay. Sometimes you would see inactive. If the person is inactive, that means that the person has failed to comply with what is needed to continue practicing. Right. Okay. Then you have things like the Nigerian Rehabilitation Board, where you can check for physiotherapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, they're registered. Any training organization mm -hmm. should have a search Record. capacity yeah. whereby 
people can go and check to confirm that they were truly qualified by you. We've had mm -hmm. instances where people have come for our training, didn't complete it, forged our certificates and gone to other you know, schools to try and get work. But because we're creating a tight network, mm -hmm. those schools refer, they come back to us to in an email reports, to verify. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right, so we have this question that says, how do you differentiate a mentally lazy child and a child with special needs? Okay. The truth of the matter is that you need to have an assessment. Sometimes parents mistake laziness for being lazy. But if the child has what they call attention deficit disorder, inattentive type, the child will come across as lazy. lazy. So parents really do need to be sure that the child is just not naturally lazy or there is a medical reason which seems to you to be lazy but, but what it not. is is that the brain doesn't have the capacity to, to work, work at the pace that the parent should feel that the child is working at at that age wow mm. so is this genetic some are genetic some for instance dyslexia dyslexia is genetic it mm. goes from father to daughter mm -hmm. from daughter to son Mm. Wow. So, father to daughter. Yes, daughter. the father so gives the, the daughter sex. and the daughter gives the son. So it flips mm. between oh. sexes each generation. Yes. Mm. yes. Wow, mm. really yes. interesting. So, okay, okay. Um, we're going to go on a break and when we come back we still have our guest here, uh, Helen Oshikoya, with us and we're still discussing special needs with children. Don't forget to send us uh, your messages and join the conversation on Twitter via Applause TV Africa or Ways Show Africa. Don't forget to use the hashtag Ways. We will be right back. Stay with us. <laughs> 